Now, the most basic of organic chemistry reactions are known as nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions. If a carbon compound contains a good leaving group, it is possible for that group to be either removed or replaced by another group. These reactions are known as substitution or elimination reactions. Now, what are the requirements for a group to be able to leave? Well, one requirement is that there has to be a polarized bond between the leaving group and the carbon atom on which it is attached. Let's give some examples. Let's say we have a carbon bromide bond. We know from general chemistry that bromide is much more electronegative than carbon is. Therefore, the electrons in the bond would prefer to stay more towards the bromide. Now, since the electrons in the bond are unequally shared, bromide would be easily taken off, making bromide a fairly good leaving group. However, if we have a carbon-carbon bond, we know that the electrons are equally shared in the bond because the two atoms are identical. Therefore, since the, bond, since the electrons in the bond are equally shared, the bond itself is very strong, making carbon a weak leaving group. Now, for substitution reactions, we want something known as a nucleophile, meaning something that is attracted to a positive charge. A good nucleophile is usually a strong base, such as hydroxide. Now, why do we want a negative charge here? Well, as you can see here, because of the polarity of the bond, the carbon is par partially positive, positively charged, and the bromide is partially negatively charged. So therefore, the negative charge of the hydroxide, or the nucleophile, would attack and be attracted to the carbon. Now, there are two different types of substitution reactions. There are SN1 and SN2 reactions. SN1 reactions are when the leaving group falls off by itself through a process that involves a solvent. Now, this only happens if the, if the weakly bonded group, the leaving group, is on a tertiary carbon because the resultant tertiary cation as an intermediate would be very stable. Therefore, the mechanism for an SN1 reaction is this. Let's first have a carbon compound in which we have the leaving group on a tertiary carbon, meaning that the carbon here is attached to three other carbon chains. Now, what's the first step in an SN1 reaction? Well, we first form an intermediate in which we form two charged particles we have that the electrons between the carbon and bromide go towards the bromide because of the solvent. Now the resultant product we get would be this tertiary cation and a negatively charged leaving group. Now, in order to do a substitution, we need a good nucleophile. So let's use OH- like we did before. So what can happen between this hydroxide and this carbon here. Well, we can have this hydroxide attack from either side because this carbon here is planar. So let's get a better look at that. Here I have a 3D representation of this compound here. So let's organize it so it actually matches it. We have the methyl group here, the ethyl group here, and the propyl group here. So if you look at this carbon right here, focus on this one, you see that there are two lines here. These represent the uh, p empty p orbital, which results from a cation here. So therefore, we can have the hydroxide essentially attack from either side of the carbon. We can have it attack from this side, or we can have it attack from this side, forming two different products. So what are those products? Let's first have it attack from this side. So what do we get? as a product. So if we have an attack from the front side, we get this. Now what do we have if we get if we had the hydroxide attack from the back side? We get this. Now, an important thing to remember is that if you have the leaving group, the bromide, on a carbon which is a stereogenic center, meaning that this carbon is attached to three different lengths of a carbon chain, let's, in this case we have an ethyl group here, a methyl group here, and a propyl group here, it forms two enantiomers. However, if you have the leaving group on a tertiary carbon which has two identical groups, meaning that it's not a stereogenic center, in this case we have two identical methyl groups here, the only product that would form would be this. Oh, no, actually not this. 
you, you don't want to draw it in 3D because that that implies that you form only one enantiomer. Instead, what you want to draw is just like this. Instead of having a bromide here, you have the hydroxide. So the product would be this. Okay? Because if you had it, no matter what side you attack, you had the hydroxide attack from the resultant cation, the product would be identical, this product. Now, how about, well, no, why do we have SM1 reactions only happen on tertiary carbons? Well, if you notice here, the most important intermediate you form is a cation here. You form a cation where the leaving group used to be. So let's instead have the leaving group on a secondary carbon. And let's try to make it happen through an SN1 mechanism. So the first step would be that the electrons to the carbon, bromide, would go towards the bromide, forming two charged molecules. First, you have a cation, a secondary cation, and a Br-. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, we know from pre uh, before that a secondary cation is much more unstable than a tertiary cation is. Therefore, instead of going on to form more products, it would much more prefer to go back to its reactant form. Therefore, since the intermediate is so shortly lived, it forms barely no product. Now, this case could also apply to a primary carbon, like so. We can have it for we can have it form a cation, like so, a primary cation. But the problem is just like before, it's so unstable that it would much rather prefer to go back to its reactant form. Therefore, in a secondary or primary carbon, we do not have an SN1 reaction happen. Instead, we have something known as an SN2 reaction happen.